So welcome. My name is Sandy Benton. I am a coach with Field Adventures, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Nature Play from Birth to Pre-K. And I am one of a team at Field Adventures. We've had a name change recently, as well as a logo change. You may have known us previously as Wisconsin Green Schools Network. We're the same great organization committed to engaging the rock skipping, frog catching spirit that lives in each of us. We're here to support you to take learning outdoors. Um, you can see me up in the upper left, followed by uh, going across Ashley Hagewald, instructional coach, Ruth Ann Lee, our Project Wet, Project Wild coordinator. Um, second row, we see Victoria Rydberg. She is a co-founder along with her son, Jay. Uh, Cheryl Chanel is one of our coaches and directors. And we have Emma Keys, who is our communications director and she's behind the scenes making this all run smoothly. Our guest speaker tonight uh, is Alondria Lewis. Alondria is the manager of early learning and training for the United Way of Greater Nashville, where she works with community early childhood teachers, instructional coaches, and leadership to build capacity within individuals and programs to ensure lifelong educational and personal successes for children and families. Alondria believes that every child deserves safe, stable, nurturing relationships and time outdoors to support academic and social emotional growth. Her goal is to provide the support and training necessary for this to happen to those that encounter children every day, from families and educational professionals to physicians and community members. Alondria holds an MA in environmental education from California State University, San Bernardino. She lives in Nashville, Tennessee with her husband, daughters, and assorted critters. So please join me in welcoming Alondria Lewis. Goodness. So thanks so much, Sandy. I'm very excited to be here today. As Sandy mentioned, uh, my name is Alandria Lewis. I am the manager of early learning and training uh, for United Way of Greater Nashville. And um, I'm uh, excited to talk to you today about early education and the outdoors, essentially. Uh, and so I always like to start my sessions with something that we call a brain smart start. Um, and so a brain smart start uh, has four components, unite, connect, disengage the stress, and a commit component. So for our Unite and Connect component today, I would really love it if you could, in the chat box, share your name, where you're calling in from, and I know some of you did that already, which is great. And if you'd like to share with us your song of the moment, that would be super fun. So I'm going to give us a uh, two minutes to go ahead and share that um, in the chat box and go ahead. Uh, I will survive. That's a good one, Victoria. Let it go. Do you have young daughters by any chance, Susan? <laughs> well, I suppose I should share with you my song at the moment, too. So um, I've got two. Uh, Life is a Highway, the Tom Cochran version, because that's the only version that counts. Um, and uh, Shotgun by George Ezra. Both travel songs, and I'm not getting to travel much. That's probably why. All right. Well, that's my timer, but just because my timer's gone off doesn't mean you have to stop sharing. But we're going to move into the disengage the stress portion, um, and we're going to do something called star breathing. Star stands for smile, take a breath, and relax. And um, research, um, including very current research that came out just last month, has shown that um, smiles, even if they're fake or forced, actually still change the hormones in your brain, which can help you shift your mood. And so if you're willing, if you would go ahead and we're going to smile, take a breath, and let it go and relax three times together. All right? So smile, take a deep breath, and relax. Smile, take a deep breath, and let it all out. One more time, smile, take a deep breath, and relax. 
And finally, for our commit portion, I'd like to do permission slips, which is a practice I've taken from Brene Brown's work. And that is essentially, what are you giving yourself permission to do during today's session? It's sort of like a personal commitment. And um, you can think of it as, you know, something that you actually have to do, like when you sign permission slips for kids to go on field trips, which they'll get to do again someday, I swear. Um, they actually go on the field trip. So this is going to be something that you actually do. So for example, my permission slip that I always write for myself when I do a virtual presentation is to do my best to connect with you, even though I feel like I'm just connecting with the little light on my video camera on my computer. <laughs> so I'm going to give us another two minutes to think about our commitment. Um, feel free to um, share in the chat box, but at least um, write it down somewhere. And it could be as simple as turning your phone over or it could be something more complex, but go ahead. Be open to letting go when sharing. That's a good commitment, Phyllis. Thank you for sharing. Smiling and breathing. That's why I like the star. It's really good for adults, not just kids. Nobody has to know you're upset. You're just smiling and breathing. All right. Well, there is my timer. And so um, feel free to keep sharing in the chat box, but we're going to go ahead and move on. My actual objectives today, and I think we're going to cross-connect on a lot of this stuff, is to help you develop a beginning understanding of why being outside is beneficial. It's really for all kids, but particularly that birth to five space. Um, to begin to explore new ways to intentionally use outdoor space for young children. And then we're going to have a little bit of a discussion on equity. And I say a little bit because equity and diversity discussions should be ongoing and they're large. Um, so we're just going to really brush the surface today. Um, but uh, hopefully it'll give you a starting point in some things. Okay. All right. So um, play in nature um, supports just so much. Um, I am a huge research nerd. And um, I, as a matter of fact, the packet um, that um, you will get uh, attached, um, I think Emma said it was going to be within the, the portal. Um, but the packet I created for you has a massive list of resources. Um, and most of which other than the books are free resources online. Um, but all of this, this entire list that you see in front of you are um, the benefits that being outdoors gives to, uh, honestly, it's all humans, but particularly children and especially young children. Um, research has proven that being outdoors boosts children's creativity as well as their ability to play creatively. All right, as well as to play cooperatively. And when we think about, say, four year olds, for example, cooperative play isn't, that's not a natural thing, right? Not always, um, particularly depending on the environment that they've grown up in in the previous four years. Um, but being outside naturally supports more cooperative play. It also, and this one usually is a gimme for most people, supports physical health. Um, so, I mean, it makes sense to us that if kids are outside, more they're exercising more um, but one of the, the couple of the two interesting things that we've seen is um, particularly around eye health and so it turns out that um, human eyes need natural light to grow appropriately and children who don't don't get enough and it's not just about screen time and being too close right it's a lack of natural light they actually need that for their eyes to grow properly as well as overall lung health because indoor air isn't always necessarily very healthy, right? And yes, of course, outdoor air isn't always the best either, um, but uh, getting more of um, the outdoor air has shown to increase lung health as well. So when we talk specifically about social emotional, which somebody had brought up in the chat, um, you know, time outside, it really helps children learn emotional regulation. Like I mentioned before, you know, it really helps with their cooperative play. Um, it helps them be kinder to each other. It helps them learn to manage their stress better. In fact, you know, green spaces, and matter of fact, you know, even just green vistas outside a window have been shown to decrease stress, especially in very stressed children. And they see that exceptionally in inner city children as well, which tend to be a bit more stressed. Um, in, you know, in children. So we see um, an increase in self-control and emotional regulation. We see a decrease in stress. And then we start looking at the academics. Um, children who have more time to explore outdoors actually have increased problem-solving skills. Um, it is improving their intellectual development, like it's literally, and their cognitive abilities, it's literally making them smarter, right? And it's helping them focus. 
as um, and in fact, there's several um, research studies by I'm the kind of nerd who has a favorite researcher, and that's Ming Kuo out of um, the University of Chicago. So if you don't know Ming Kuo's work, Q K U O, I uh, highly recommend you looking into her work because she does amazing work on the benefits of being outdoors, particularly for kids and their education. Um, but uh, she helped author two papers in particular around children with attention deficit syndrome and the benefits to being outdoors. And the, um, they found that being outside um, provides a, a lot of the benefits that actually medication does. And in fact, um, a lot of kids have been able to either decrease or get rid of medication by just spending time outdoors. And the greener the space, the better the results. I'm going to pause a second. All right. What questions do you have about that? Yes, Ming Kuo, K-U-O. Um, she also, you'll see her as Francis, um, and I believe she just decided to go by her, um, from what I've been told, by her given um, uh, name, which was Ming, rather than Americanizing it with Francis. Um, but yes, K-U-O. Matter of fact, well, let's go to the next page. And here's, here's, it's not a direct quote from her, um, but one of the most fascinating pieces of research that I've read lately, again by Dr. Kuo, was that children actually learn better and retain knowledge longer when they're taught outdoors. So you could take, and, and she actually did this in her, in her study, you could take, say, a um, elementary school age classroom, right, um, and the exact same language arch lesson. So maybe they're you know, like my daughter right now is in fourth grade. So she's writing an essay on why um, arachne, um, why it was a good idea that uh, Athena turned arachne into a spider because uh, they're doing some Greek myths, right? So you could do that exact same lesson indoors and then with another group of kids, the exact same lesson outdoors. We're not doing an actual outdoor activity, quote unquote, right? We're not looking at bugs or anything like that. We're doing a regular language arts activity. And what she found was children actually learned more and retained the information longer when they were taught those lessons outside. That's how powerful getting kids outdoors is. Absolutely, Kathy. Do everything outdoors. The more you can do, the better. And that can be hard, especially, you know, in this day and age. Like, I wish my daughter could be doing class outdoors because she's all virtual, but the web, you know, the um, internet's not so great outside, right? Um, so how do we, how do we deal with that? Um, but yeah, anything that you can do outside. So we're just going to do a quick brain break. I need this because I hurt my back this week. So we're just going to do some shoulder and neck rolls. All right. So what we're going to do is we are going to take our shoulders. We're going to shrug them up to our ears. And then we're going to roll them down our back. So we try to get our shoulder blades to meet. Okay. And when you do that, I want you to inhale up, exhale back. So let's inhale up, exhale back, inhale up, exhale back. Inhale up, exhale back, tilt your head one way, and then the other, and then just shake it out. All right. So what is outdoor learning for little kids, right? For our littles, it is structured activities. So like I said, anything that you can do indoors, you can do outdoors, and it's usually better. Um, some of the things that um, Ming Kuo said in her research study is she hasn't proven this yet, but her guess is that because kids are just more engaged outdoors, and remember that list I gave you earlier of all the research benefits of being outside, that's why they learn better. So really any structured activity, um, so almost any activity you would normally do indoors, just take it outside, right? But also activities to spec um, is specifically designed to be outdoors, which are actually some of the activities we'll be talking about today. Um, because I don't need to talk to you about all the stuff you do indoors. You already have all those activities. Just take them outside, right? But so we'll talk about some specifically designed uh, activities for outside. And then also adult involved free play. So I can't emphasize that one enough. Um, children need time um, to play. Uh, play is children's work, right? Um, and this is, it's, it's not extra. It is essential. And so we need to make sure that we're allowing kids um, time to just explore, to get bored, to, and then find new ideas and go explore again. 
Um, and thank you, Victoria, for the link there. I'm stealing that one too. Um, so, um, so I mean, essentially, outdoor learning is is really anything that you want it to be, including for babies, right? So, if I'm doing um, activities in a classroom, you know, for a six month old, where we're exploring different shapes and different textures, why can't I explore shapes and textures outside? Anything you can do inside, you can take outside. Okay, so here's some pictures of what that could look like. Just a few, right? So you know. What do, you, what do you see here? Tell me what you see. Le learning colors, absolutely. For early children, that's important. Yes, they're, they're happy. Kids are always happy outdoors. Even when they're unhappy. We're developing language skills, absolutely. Very hands-on. Yeah, outdoor letter line. Um, Caring for nature, because yeah, we can't expect kids to, you know, people to care for something they don't have experience with, right? Full body contact, yep. All right, and so, like I said, um, outdoor play for littles is anything that you would do indoors. And so, you know, a lot of the skills that we're looking in, um, you know, the infant arena are um those those social emotional skills as well as um you know gross motor um all of those can be um done outside your you know your toddlers um again you know gross motor but obviously um we're beginning to do um more literacy activities besides just read alouds with kids um which are wonderful outdoors um but all of those again you can do outside and usually in just such engaging ways and ways kids are really going to um, enjoy them um and you know with your threes and fours again so much more exploration um and you know their their um, ability to be engaged in what they're doing for all of them is really going to ramp up the educational value of whatever you're doing You're absolutely right, Megan. It's sometimes easier for parents, you know, and well, all of us to be outside and join in the fun, right? Who can resist tossing leaves in the air with a child, right? I mean, too fun. Um, and besides, great picture opportunities too, as a mom. So much fun. <laughs> all right. So, um, but a lot of people have concerns about bringing kids outdoors, right? About the materials they may play in with, about the fact they might get dirty, um, about, you know, their parents might be upset. Right. I was one of the rare moms whenever I picked my child up and she was filthy. That was awesome. <laughs> and I would tell them specifically that that was awesome because most, you know, they would always be like, man, everybody's always upset when they're dirty. I'm like, no. Um, because that means she was, you know, outside, you know, in it. But not everybody feels that way. So what are some of your concerns about taking children outside? If, if pretty much anything you can do um, educationally with a kid, you can do outdoors, why would we not take them outside? What are some of your thoughts that are like, yeah, but. Or concerns that you hear from your administrators or. Mm, that too. Members. Okay, so legit dangerous like cacti and rattlesnakes, absolutely. Um, with the youngest children, what kind of surfaces can you use, create, or might avoid? Okay. So um, to Kathy's point, there, there are legit dangers out there, right? Like you see this little boy building his tower. You wouldn't want him to build it so high with such heavy things that it might fall on him, right? So we want to make sure that we're involved. So you notice earlier I said teacher involved free play. That's really important. Educating the children on what risks are. You'd be surprised by how many kids. I grew up in the desert, actually, in California. And um, we, we knew what we needed to do and what not to do. Like I grew up camping, you know, in, you know, Mojave rattler we'll have a green rattler country and you know we we were told what to do by our um uh people around us and we figured it out right um and with the youngest children with the surfaces so i'm gonna turn that back on you guys so what surfaces do you have so like Teresa says she has all blacktop no grass is there anything wrong with that i would suggest maybe bringing out um, a sheet or a tarp, or if you've got one of those parachutes, parachutes are awesome. Um, you know, bring out a parachute, right? Up to, and there's the po uh, the uh, silver lining there, Victoria. Chalk works really well on blacktop, absolutely. Right? Blacktop is still outdoors. 
we often forget that um, nature is everything, right? We are all part of the outdoors. So the cars, the buildings, um, the airplanes, us, that's still part of it, the blacktop, right? Um, and so that is, um, you know, even when you're still outside, regardless of the surface, um, you just want to make sure that if you've got kiddos who fall a lot, that you're just being as careful as you would inside on tile, right? All right so Kathy said in some of the urban areas we use the homeless population can be a concern for parents. So my question for you is, is that a legitimate concern such as uh, rattlesnakes? Um, or is it a concern that, and I fall into this group too, that parents um, you know, will we get up so my kid can't play in, in the front yard by herself because I'm worried about that kind of concern. Whereas my mom wouldn't have blinked, blinked twice if I was, and I often was, wandering down my street by myself, right? Um, and so having conversations with our families about what the actual concerns are and what it would take to mitigate those concerns for them. All right. Ooh, that's a good question. A good suggestion, Victoria. Getting a carpet store to donate carpet squares. That is harder to do these days, um, but it definitely is still an option, right? And one of the great things, again, being aware of plants that are harmful, and again, um, rattlesnakes, um, strangers just in general, whether it's the homeless population, which often um, gets a, more of a bad rap than they deserve, um, depending on the area. Um, it's about you know educating the children too. We talk about, do we talk to strangers? I don't care who they are, right? It could be Joey's mommy, but if you don't know Joey's mommy, you ain't talking to her, right? Um, and also educating them in, all right, let's take a look at this plant. You know, oh, look, it's got sharp spines. What does that mean? It probably means that's gonna bite us, right? <laughs> if we get too close. So having that education, rather than just being scared of not taking our kids outside, um, of, you know, educating them and enlisting them in the safety as well, even our youngest ones and weather in general. Although I do want to challenge, I don't live in Wisconsin, so pick that as a caveat. I'm in the South um, now, but um, I do want to challenge you that weather always looks worse from a window, right? And as long as it's not dangerous out, kids don't care. I distinctly remember walking around with my daughter when she was about three, and we would always go out to the playground next to her daycare. Um, and it was, I remember it was like January, February, and it was cold, not Wisconsin cold, but cold for us. And I kept putting her hood up and she kept running around and it'd flap off, she didn't care. And it wasn't cold enough to be dangerous, right? And so exactly, Kathy, there's no such thing as bad weather, just poor clothing choices. And again, that requires communication with families. So for the sake of time, we're gonna dip here into some activity exploration. So um, because I was unable to get um, your packet to you in time today, I'm actually gonna bring it up and share it with you. Um, so let me actually stop this share and start a new share. So the packet that you will have access to um, actually has a list of outdoor learning activity ideas. You see some of these pictures there. Um, and so what I want to do in the chat box really quick, um, well, not just in the chat box, so I'm gonna go through a few of these myself. And then in the chat box, um, it would be great if um, you could also share some ideas, which we'll do in a moment. So as I mentioned before, um, anything that you do inside, you can take outdoors. As a matter of fact, um, and I've done this with my teachers before, um, I've challenged them to give me something that you think can't be taken outside. Right. And about the only thing we've been able to come up is, well, if they've got some technology time and it happens to be a desktop machine, then I'm like, you know what, take them outside anyway and do something different. <laughs> um, but so pretty much, you know, take your read alouds outside. That's a really easy thing to uh, do in the beginning. Um, but um, if you're working on literacy, this uh, type of thing can start with infants. Um, we're going to go around looking for outdoor items that start with letters or letter sounds or letter shapes, right? With your littlest ones, you wanna be engaged in more phonological awareness, which is the um, understanding of the sounds of language without the print, right? So you can be walking a six month around or you know, sitting with families and pointing out, oh, hey, this is um, a tree. It starts with t, 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 the t, t, t sound. You don't even have to get into T's right? We're just talking about the sounds. Um, so you can do um, alphabet walks. 
um, blind texture boxes can be really fun for kids, as well as I had a picture of this earlier, um, bubble pops, just exploring with the bubbles and seeing what they're doing. Um, but also, um, well, as they get older, you can use it as a math activity. Kathy said, printed things that may require it, right, I'm taking books along for doing research. Right, those of us who grew up without technology, we can, we can figure that out. Sometimes it's a little more difficult as we're younger, but we all have our challenges, right? <clears throat> um, taking a look at bug walks, doing um, freeze dances, right? Or different types of um, dances outside um, and music activities. Um, leaf collages, I love doing cloud shapes um, with kids. Um, so really just talking about the shapes with younger kids, but with older kids, you can take Play-Doh, or wiki sticks, or if you're really brave, mud or clay, and have them look up and see the cloud shapes and then make those cloud shapes. I've done this actually with the, my teachers where they take wiki sticks, which are those waxy sticks, and lay on their backs, look at the sky, and like trace the wiki stick shape around the clouds, right? And it leads to activities about talking about shapes. So you've got a math lesson in there, right? Um, painting with mud. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to paint with mud before, but oh my gosh, it's so much fun. <laughs> Especially if you can bring in different colors of mud. Um, and you can also make um, uh, natural paint brushes. You just need um, clothespins and then you can stick um, grass in there. You can stick leaves in there. You can um, do some, you know, man-made stuff like cotton balls and stuff as well. Uh, but also, and then you've got lots of things to play with that texture. Um, being able to explore um, the sounds that outdoor things make, right? What sound does a blacktop make when we smack it, right? What sound does a blacktop make when we smack it with a rock, right? What um, sound does the tree wake make when we smack it? Um, talking about, you know, what things we need to have gentle touch to, because if you see a ladybug, you probably shouldn't see what sound it makes, right? Um, but you also, you know, going around and just exploring with us, um, which leads me to one of my thoughts that I forgot to add earlier. One of the things that we often forget um, about <clears throat> young children is um, that that whole idea of it's, you know, their job to play. Um, they are actually learning how the world works, right? One of the reasons that kids, you know, a classic example, kids sitting in a high chair constantly knocks a sippy cup off, and every time mom picks it up, and that's sort of a game. We tend to think of it as adults that, oh, well, you just think it's a game because I'll keep getting it for you. When usually it's a game because, dude, I pushed it and it fell again. Well, let's see what happens this time. Oh, I pushed it and it fell again. Oh, my gosh. Right? And that's the same thing outdoors. Um, what do these different textures feel like? Um, wow, up in the sky, it's usually, you know, there, there's trees, I see clouds, I see blue. I may not have the words for them if I'm very young, although that's also literacy development as we point out those um, names of things. Um, but we, we, you know, one of the great things about outdoor play is it allows kids to um, experience more about the world than they have available to them inside. And that's really an obligation on ourselves to um, be able to provide them with that so they can see that um, what is wind? We can experience that indoors. Like air can move, right? Air can, you can feel air, like that's kind of crazy, right? Um, so there's other ideas that are in this um, packet that um, you'll see, such as doing shadow play, taking shape walks. Somebody mentioned spray bottles earlier and, you know, doing spray bottle painting is lots of fun. Um, exploring tree bark. Um, and, and all of these can be used at different levels from the youngest babies, take the tree bark, bark rubbings, right? The youngest babies, we're just putting their hands on it and letting them touch it. Oh, you know, see, feel the difference. This is rough. Now feel this branch. It's smooth, right? To our four-year-olds are doing, you know, bark rubbings, right? With just paper and crayons. Okay. Um, and so there's some great activities in there. See, Kathy brought up Growing Wild. That's a great one. There's another one. Um, I think that's Project Wild. I think Project Learning Tree, and I can't remember the name of their curriculum, has a um, early learning curriculum as well. That's fantastic. But I'll be honest, a lot of these were created by my uh, teachers. And then the ones that weren't, I just honestly went on Pinterest and went early learning stuff. And it works really well. Um, the internet is a wonderful um, resource for all this kind of stuff these days. So I'm going to bring us back to this. So hopefully you can see my screen. 
and my chat keeps running away. So while we are, while I'm looking through the chat, what are your thoughts so far? Here's one about taking a rock. This is from Teresa and smashing a leaf onto paper or a hanky to like make that leaf imprint. I love that. That's wonderful. It's a great idea. A lot of people say given positive uh, feedback on growing up wild as a resource for early learning. Mud painting with, uh, and then adding a little bit of tempera, powder tempera. Wonderful. So I, I would actually like to challenge the powder tempera. So that can be a lot of fun. And it's great when we're wanting to explore different colors. Really try and go out, even if it's just in your backyard in a local park, and find different colors of uh, dirt. Right? Find some with some iron in it to make you red. Right? Let kids really explore the actual natural colors that earth comes in. Not that the, I, I, the tempera thing, I've done it myself. It's a lot of fun because um, you still get the texture in there. I found my chat box. All right, I've never had that much difficulty finding my chat box before. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, so Phyllis, yes, finding dirt and soil locally can also lead to lessons on soils for older kids. Um, engaging your families. So I'll, you'll hear me bring this up a lot because um, it's one of my passions of getting more families involved. Um, having them bring, you know, a, a small thing of uh, dirt from their backyard. Like, oh, this is from, you know, Juan's backyard. This is from um, Tim's backyard. This is from, you know, Victoria's backyard. Um, that is super cool. Right. Um, Tinker Garden is another great resource. Rusty Keeler is also a great resource that I want to throw out there. Um, he's got a lot of stuff on risky play, um, which is very fascinating. All right. So let's move because we only have about 12 more minutes or so um, to a conversation that's going to take a whole lot longer than 12 minutes. Right. And that's a conversation about equity and inclusion. Right. So um, equity and inclusion, um, I mean, that's a huge issue in outdoor education, um, partly because it's a huge issue in education in general, and it's a huge issue in our society. Right. Um, the, um, just to kind of cover real quick to make sure we're all on the same page, right? um, equity doesn't mean necessarily that everybody's getting the same. What equity means is everybody is getting what they need. Right. So um, if let's take an older child example, let's say I'm a third grader who's not reading very well. Right. And my buddy sitting next to me is a third grader who's reading at a fifth grade level. Who should get the um, extra reading instruction? That's me. It's not equal. It's not fair, but it's equitable. Okay. And then inclusion um, really means and, and really I also like to say representation um, really means um, having every, uh, you know, as many people as possible having access to whatever it is. And, um, you know, when you've got, say, a program that, um, let's say you've got an outdoor learning program um, or even a childcare program, that representation and inclusion would look like um, the, you know, your staff as well as your student body um, representing the, um, the demographics of your surrounding area. Right. So if your surrounding area um, was, you know, very heavily, say, um, African-American and um, Kurdish and Latino, which is what my area is, then your program should have representation in that area. Right. So there is definitely an issue of that in outdoor ed, but it's not alone. The entire educational system has that issue as well as our society. So let's look at that issue a little bit. So. Um, and if you want to, you can raise your hand if you want, or you can sh hit the chat or whatever, but raise your hand if you've heard of the um, uh, word gap in kids, that literacy gap that children have um, who come from low-income families. Okay, So it's a real thing. If for some reason you haven't heard it, um, there's a lot of research around um, you know, children who come from uh, lower-income families tend to have been exposed to fewer words than children from higher uh, income families. Um, and what we're really finding out in the research is that uh, so much of that is, it's, it's not about the amount of words, it really isn't, it's about the type of words. It's about children being um, engaged in conversation as opposed to just being told what to do. Um, which um, makes sense when you think about a family that maybe um, mom has three jobs just trying to make ends meet um, and probably doesn't have a lot of energy when she gets home to really talk to her four-year-old. Right. Um, so there's also a science achievement gap. 
Um, and what we're seeing is, is very much the same thing, that students from low-income families have been shown to have a gap in science knowledge um, upon kindergarten entry. Um, and for those, the gap, it still largely remains in third grade, and they're still struggling in eighth grade, and I'm sure you can make that um, extrapolation to, um, you know, adulthood as well. Um, so, I mean, that's an issue. Um, and one of those reasons is because children from lower income communities are particularly at risk for not going outside when they're at home, as well as sometimes in their um, childcare centers, right? I can think of, so in um, the, the job that I have, um, which entails coming and speaking to people a lot like I'm doing to you now, but also um, entails supporting support 10 childcare centers in the greater Nashville area. And, um, you know, I think about um, some of our centers that we support, say, in North Nashville, which is a lower socioeconomics um, area. And if they did not have um, their own outdoor space, which is amazing, I tell you stories about it sometime, there would be nowhere for their kids to go when they were outside. Um, there is nowhere for those kids to go when they go home, right? The only outdoor place in that neighborhood is a basketball court where there's frequent shootings. So whether a teacher or a, um, a parent wants to get their kids outside can sometimes be highly irrelevant if there is no place for them to get them outside, right? And a lot of science knowledge, as we talked about earlier, comes directly from just being able to explore, right? Just being able to understand how the world works because I've had a chance to touch a tree and feel the wind and all that good stuff. So. Well, I love this quote by Richard Louv, um, that every child needs nature. We've talked about that kind of a little bit already. And it's not just the ones whose parents appreciate nature. Like my kid gets to get out all the time. We're going camping for Halloween, which by the way, if you've never done, is a delight because they do trick or treating at the campsites. It's so much fun. Um, so not only those whose parents appreciate nature, but and not only those of a certain economic class or culture or set of abilities, but every single kid. Every single kid deserves to get those academic and social emotional benefits of getting outside, right? So this is the problem that kids don't, right? Kids are not getting the same thing. We're seeing the same thing. I um, do a lot of um, work in not just, you know, outdoor ed is one of my passions of social emotional learning, but I do a lot of work in literacy too. Um, and, you know, we're, we, we see the same problem um, with uh, literacy rates, with the third grade reading crisis. Um, and that, you know, every child deserves to be, have access to high quality literacy instruction, but they don't get that either, right? Um, sadly, one of the ways that we can help kids achieve more um, in, you know, just sheer academically is by getting them outside more. Um, in fact, there's been research that's shown that physical activity, um, especially if it's physical activity outdoors, actually increases kids' GPAs. There's, that's really just initial research on that, but it's still really, really powerful. So, so here's the problem, right? Um, and if you think, I, you know, I know some of you are um, running uh, programs um, that you guys are all from, you know, different uh, career walks of life, shall we say. Um, but, and thank you for saying the um, opportunity gap, um, Sandy, um, that's awesome. Um, because a lot of people will call it like the achievement gap. And there, it's not an achievement gap, it's a lack of being connected to the opportunities. Because what I was about to say was, you know, thinking about the programs that you um, lead or you participated in outdoors, and then I want you to think about the demographics of the people that are participating in those, right? So I was with my, um, I was co-leader for my daughter's Girl Scout troop, and we were at um, our Warner Parks, which Nashville has some amazing parks with old growth forests, like in the middle of the city. It's kind of uh, amazing. Um, we were there with my Girl Scout troop, and every single person we met on the trail was white. Every single one, right? Um, and that's great that there were that many people there. Don't get me wrong. I want everybody outdoors, right? But it's a problem that we didn't see um, any children of color out there. As a matter of fact, um, I only saw about, I believe I was counting, that I hit about eight kids and we saw close to 40 people, right? But you know, it's, it's an issue. So when you think about the experiences that you've had, whether it's work or social, you know, you can see this issue playing out. So how do we change this? And I know some of you were hoping I had the answers. I don't. <laughs> I would like to have the answers. Um, but how do, how do we change this? 
when you think about, because the, the reason I don't have the answers is because it's going to be different for every single program in every single area, right? Because it's going to depend on the, um, the environment that you are living in, um, both socially and naturally. Uh, it's going to depend on the people that you work with. Are they flexible to thinking about how, um, you know, dominant culture is really influencing um, the policies uh, within the program that may be um, not supporting uh, true, you know, equity and, and inclusion within the program? Um, or is it more that, um, is it a money issue? That's often an issue, right? Is it that, you know, um, people, you know, just can't access the program. I don't know, right? Because that's your program. So what I want to give you some time to think about and even talk about is how do we then think about changing this within our ear program? I know within our program, um, we are doing some um, culturally responsive anti-bias training and then really trying to dig into what that actually looks like um, within our centers as well as within our program as a whole. Um, but that's just us right? And it's just the tip of the iceberg. And um, I'm going to invite you to, if you want to put it in the chat box, feel free. Or if you want to unmute yourself and either ask a question, because I don't expect you to have an answer either. I really don't, um, because we're all exploring this together, right? Um, but if you've started doing some work on looking at equity in um, outdoor programs, um, you know, um, give us some ideas on what you've done. Um, and if you just have questions on what that might look like. All right, Kathy, I see that in there. And by the way, hi, Kathy, you're in my um, Inquiry Outdoors group, weren't you? Um, so when you have an accessible, equitable program and are doing all you can for it to be open to all, how do you help change those families' mindsets? Um, so, um, Kathy, tell, tell me a little bit more about what mindset needs changing. I'm just going to unmute myself. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, um, you know, my program, I mean, we have actually – quite a mix. Um, now I have a homeschool program, which obviously presents its own challenges because you kind of have to be a homeschooler um, or maybe thinking about homeschool. Like we have some pre-K kids that aren't necessarily homeschooling yet, but um, like it's, you know, for some people, it's just not a priority for their kids to necessarily be outdoors, mm -hmm. even if those opportunities are available. So like I do free family hikes and I do free stuff and as well as um, paid stuff, or I tell people like, oh, I'll work with you on money or whatever. Um, like, I'm not in this to make money, I'm in it to get kids outdoors. So, um, you know, and it's just, people aren't taking advantage of those things. And like, I even volunteer with a bunch of organizations, I'm a master naturalist. And, um, you know, for some people, it's just not a priority. I don't even, I don't like, and that's regardless of your race. I mean, there's plenty of white families You're who don't have right. their children mm -hmm. outdoors. So, um, you know, it's more, in my opinion, it's more of changing people's mindsets about mindsets about the outdoors and being outdoors. Uh, because you could all day long be offering free programs. I mean, I once had 10 families sign up and none of them showed. <laughs> so Those things are an issue can, in a lot of places. Yeah. yeah. So you, can, you know, you can <laughs> offer these things and still not get people coming because it is a, sometimes it's a cultural thing. Uh, for example, I'm in Arizona. We have a large Hispanic community um, and majority of the, the parents work outdoors all day long you know, taking their kids out on a weekend is not something they want to be doing when they've been right. working eight, you know, eight to 10 hours a day outside. Um, so, yeah, right. so, so I think there's yeah. a lot more to it. And, you know, some people you're just, you're not going to change your mind. It's not a priority for them. You know, like, like homeschooling is a priority for me, but that's not a priority for everybody. Um, so I think too, it just comes down to the to people, their priorities, their goals, what they want for their children. And you could, like I said, you, all day long, you can make stuff equitable and open to people and they're still not going to come. Well, and, and so that's, that's a really good point is, how, you know, the, one of the big issues around outdoor learning is that not everybody understands the importance of it. Um, usually when I do a talk, you know, the way I talk about the benefits of outdoor learning, like we did briefly earlier, um, there's at least one, if not more benefits that some people have no idea was a benefit. I, you know, um, one of the big ones is usually like how many people knew that you needed natural light for your eyes to grow properly. Yeah, I didn't. I always thought the reason kids were needing more 
glasses, more and more kids were needing glasses was because of the screen issue. Now it's the natural light issue, right? And so helping people understand, and for those of us who are advocates for getting kids outdoors, is continuing, you know, being what an actual advocate is, that definition of an advocate is making sure that you're talking about that to as many people as possible, right? Like here I am talking to a Wisconsin group from Tennessee, pandemic silver lining that we even have that happening. So that's awesome. Um, but really getting that out there. And I also want to challenge you, Kathy. Thank you also for, for bringing that up. And um, someday when I drive back to California, I want to go through Arizona again and come see your program. Um, so I want to challenge you though, Kathy, about um, looking at, so we've made the program equitable. Have we really made the program equitable? I mean, we're doing the same thing in our program right now because the majority of, of um, children that we serve are African-American. And so, um, and the majority of people who do the serving are also African-American. Most of them don't look like me. Um, am I doing everything that I can within my program to meet their needs, right? Including transportation. Do people want to attend, but they can't get there? Timing. Do people want to attend, but they work, you know, second shift and they can't, right? Or they work Saturdays and the offerings on a Saturday, you know, whatever that might be. So um, they, you may be answered, yeah, of course, I've offered transport. You may be giving me yeses on all of those, uh, but I just want to offer the challenge. Somebody had mentioned in here, um, Emma did, listening to the needs of the people in your community um, to create accessible, culturally relevant programming. This is one of the traps we fall into in education all the time. I see this. I see it play out in my daughter's school all the time. They put on these great events, so this pre-COVID, obviously, great events and nobody shows up because they never asked anybody whether or not they wanted to come to that event. They never asked them what time. They never asked them, how can we best serve you, right? We, we tend to often, and I've been guilty of the exact same thing. Like I started in K-12 as a fourth grade teacher, so I've been guilty of the exact same thing of, well, this is, I would like this. Why wouldn't they like this? And haven't asked my community about it. Right. Um, so what we, you know, um, what is our responsibility really to do when we're talking about equity and inclusion is turn our around to the community and say, what, you know, I want, I want to be able to give this to you. What is standard? What is the barrier? And if the barrier is, well, I just don't think that's important, then we address that barrier. But maybe that's not the barrier. Maybe it's, like I said, maybe it's transportation. We don't know. Um, but um, helping to educate. Um, Susan had a great thing thinking about those, um, particularly infant toddler teachers, but also um, infant toddler parents who don't enjoy the process of getting their littles dressed up to go outside. Infant toddler teachers, you know, um, in our area, they have um, four babies to one teacher. Um, in some areas, I know ratio is a bit bigger than that. Um, but even, four, can you imagine get, dressing four babies to go outside in the rain? <laughs> totally get that. And it's really the root of why kids don't get taken outside very much at school and at home, um, but particularly at school, because the teachers look outside and go, I don't want to do that. And so there's, there's the issue of, I've got to get my kids ready for that. I've got to discuss it with my parents. And they've got to be okay with the fact that their kids are going to be muddy when they get home because we were outside in the rain or whatever. There's also an issue that our teachers aren't always comfortable with getting outdoors. I mentioned that in my program, um, the majority of our teachers, it's over 95% of my teachers um, and um, about 85% of the administrators in my program are African-American, right? They're black. And so um, unfortunately what that means is most of them don't have a lot of really good feelings about being outside because they have not had the experiences because of this lack of equity in access to um, outdoor education and outdoor experiences in general. So when I've got a three-year-old teacher who, yeah, logically she gets that she wants, you know, she wants to take her kids outside, but she's not comfortable outdoors. That is not her happy place because she was never taught that that could be a happy place. One of my very best friends is Haitian and we laugh all the time. She knows exactly because I've told her 400 times how great it is to be outdoors and having kids in the dirt and she just can't handle it when the kids come across worms. Oh my God, don't touch the worms, don't touch the bugs, right? Because it just creeps her out because it just does. She didn't have a lot of outdoor experiences. She also grew up in New York City. That doesn't help, you know. Um, but those are, those are big issues. Um, and so, Sandy, you had a great point of creating opportunities. Thank you, Alondrio. Okay. Um, I think I can speak for the group that you've given us a lot to think about and a lot of um, ideas and collaboratively how we've been using the chat, too, that participants, you've you're building on the ideas and that's 
that's exactly uh, why we develop this network and why we bring these opportunities. And um, thank you, Alondria, for you know bringing this important um, idea and need uh, to the forefront for the opportunity gap for our youngest learners. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Victoria Rydberg, who is going to um, talk about some other opportunities and how to stay connected. I'll try to keep it brief for you all. I know we're a little bit over time. So um, Growing Up Wild came up in our conversation today and Field Adventures is the state coordinator for Growing Up Wild and has some Growing Up Wild books that you can purchase directly from Field Adventures. They're $35 and we will ship them right to you. Um, you don't have to go through a training to get Growing Up Wild. So we would love to connect you with that. Um, and we can include that information in the follow-up resources and how to get that. Um, at the end of our campfires, we always like to leave with our campfire recipe. And today we thought it only appropriate to have a campfire recipe uh, for some nature play. So we just wanted you to think about making mud pie and how much fun that is for little kids. A handful of dirt, some water, wonder, curiosity, bake it outside and experience the joy. So just some, some parting thoughts for you with the, our campfire recipe. And then if you enjoyed tonight's program um, and have the means to do so, we, in, we invite you to consider making a small financial contribution to Field Adventures. Field Adventures is a 501c3 organization and seeks grants and donations and program revenue to meet our mission of taking learning outside. We realize also that financial contributions may not be available or may not be um, work for everyone, which is why we offer these free events. So another way you can show that you valued today's session is um, by participating in our educator community, and I'll show you how to do that following us on Facebook, or inviting a colleague to attend a future event with you. So thank you so much for being here. Um, Emma is gonna drop that link in the chat if you'd like to do that, or you can use your phone and scan that QR code. And we would love for you to stay connected with us and keep the conversation going in our free online community where you all RSVP, that's at connectexploreengage.org. Uh, we have an early childhood group in there we join it, let's share resources, let's keep this work moving forward. And we will see you at a future session. Thank you so much for being here.